So welcome to National 4, National 5 Chemistry and this section of lessons is all going to be on calculations. So we're going to start with going over chemical formula and work our way up to calculations known as mole calculations. So our first lesson is on chemical formula and our aim is to understand how chemical formula are written and how to write common chemical formula from the names of chemicals. So in terms of success criteria, we want you to be able to state what valency means, to write the chemical formula from the names of compounds, and use common chemistry prefixes. So by the end of today, you'll understand what it means if a chemical contains the term mono, di, tri, tetra, penta or hexa in its name. So looking at chemical formula, um, chemical formula contain element symbols and they contain numbers. Now if you look at the chemical formula on the left hand side, you can see that when it comes to numbers, they always come after symbols. They are always written in small, what we would call subscript, and to the bottom right of a symbol. The numbers tell you how many atoms of that particular element there are, and if an element doesn't have a number after it, it means that there's only one of those atoms. So for example, in H2O, there are two H's and one O. In CO2, there is one C and two O's. In NH3, there is one nitrogen, one N, and three H. And in that bottom one aluminium oxide, there are two Al and three O. Um, and basically, that's what I just said. Uh, now, valency. Valency is a term that you would uh, probably have looked at whenever you looked at atomic structure. And valency is the word we use to describe the number of electrons that an atom will gain, share or lose in order to get a full outer shell. Now, in your data booklet, you're given lots of bits of information about elements, but valency is not one of them. So valency is something that you need to be able to remember or to work out from an element's position in the periodic table. So the way to remember this is to look in your data booklet at the page um, that has electron arrangements or electron structures, um, electron configurations on it. And from that one, you'll see that there are eight groups listed on that page. And they're groups number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Um, now, for each group, it has a valency. Now, for group one, the valency is one. For group two, the valency is two. For group three, the valency is three. And for four, it's four. However, once we get to group five, the numbers in terms of valency drop back down again. So if you're in group five, um, you drop to have a valency of three. Group six, you have a valency of two. Group seven, you have a valency of one. And group eight has a valency of zero. Also, what we can say is that groups one, two, and three, most of those are metals, and metals lose electrons. The elements in group four, five, six, and seven, a lot of them are non-metals, and they will share or gain electrons. And the reason why group eight or group zero, as it's sometimes known, or the, the noble gases, have a valency of zero is because they already have a full outer shell and will not form bonds. So valency is really important and you will be using valency when it comes to writing chemical formula. So let's just see what can you remember. So if you want to, you can pause this video and have a go at these questions. The first question is, what is meant by valency? Why do noble gases not form bonds? And then it is a task where you'll need to get uh, a periodic table to look up the group valency and work out whether or not those four elements lose, gain, share electrons, and if so, how many. 
So hopefully you've paused the video and had a go at these questions, but the first one, what is meant by valency? Well, valency is the number of electrons that an element or atom must lose, gain or share in order to get a full outer shell of electrons. Why do noble gases not form bonds? Well, they already have a full outer shell of electrons and do not need to lose, gain or share electrons. And when it comes to filling out that table, iodine is in group seven. It has a valency of one. It is one of those elements that will gain or share electrons because it is a non-metal. And how many electrons it will gain or share? Well, it's the same as the valency, so that's one. Aluminium is in group three. It has a valency of three. It is a metal, so it loses electrons, and it will lose three electrons. Magnesium is in group two. It has a valency of two. And it is a metal, so it will lose electrons, and the number of electrons it will lose is two. Silicon is in group four and has a valency of four. It is a non-metal, so it will gain or share electrons, and the number of electrons that it will gain or share is four. Now we're gonna look at the first type of compounds, and those are the compounds where their name immediately tells you the formula. So chemical names always have at least two parts separated by a space. Good examples, sodium chloride, carbon dioxide, iron sulfate. The first part of the name is always the element from the group with the lowest number. So for ionic compounds, what that means is that metals, which are in groups one, two, or three, will always go before non-metals, which are in groups four, five, six, seven. When it comes to covalent compounds, um, what you need to do is look at the positions. So nitrogen and oxygen, whenever they react, nitrogen is in group three, uh, sorry, nitrogen is in group five, oxygen is in group six. Whenever they react to form a compound, nitrogen will come before oxygen. So it's nitrogen oxide rather than oxygen nitride. Um, for compounds reacting with hydrogen, for example, hydrogen reacting with chlorine. Well, chlorine is in group seven. Hydrogen is often written in group one, so hydrogen will come before chlorine, so it will be hydrogen chloride. When it comes to naming compounds, always the name of the first element in the chemical formula, it keeps its name. And the name of the second element is usually changed so that it ends with the letters I, D, E. So for example, oxygen will become oxide, nitrogen will become nitride, chlorine will become chloride. And this is in the majority of cases. Now some chemical compounds have additional little parts of words in their name that are not just telling you about the element so carbon dioxide contains tri, iron trichloride contains tri, and xenon pentafluoride contains penta. Those additional parts are clues telling you how many of each element there are. So carbon dioxide, the formula is CO2. That di is telling you that there are two oxygens. Iron trichloride is telling you that there are three chlorines. So the formula is FeCl3. And xenon pentafluoride, well, that penta is telling you that there are five fluorines. So the formula is XeF5. So the clues that are found inside the names of some chemical formula are things like mono, or sometimes just mon, that means one, di for two, tri for three, tetra for four, penta for five and hexa for six. If a chemical has any of those um, clues, mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, you should just be able to write the formula from the name. So if, an, uh, if a compound contains any of the clues at any part of its name, you could work out the formula without needing to use valency. So if there is a clue within the elements, uh, within the compound's name anywhere, you need to remember two things. So if in the formula, any part of the formula that does not have a clue, there's only one of that element. 
And if an element does contain a clue, the clue tells you how many there are of that element. So here are a few for you to try. Dihydrogen oxide, aluminium trichloride, carbon tetrafluoride, and dialuminium trioxide. Again, you can pause the video if you need to for this. Well, hopefully you've had a go. Dihydrogen oxide, well, the dihydrogen, the clue is on the hydrogen and it is di for two. So the formula is H2O. The oxide part doesn't have any clue on it, so it's just one. Aluminium, no clue, so it's just one, Al. Trichloride, tri means three, so AlCl3. Carbon tetrafluoride, so tetra is the clue in that. The tetra is part of the fluoride, so that means there's four fluorines. And the carbon, because it doesn't have one of these clues, is just a C, one. Dialuminium trioxide, well, there's two clues. There's di for aluminium and there's tri for oxide, and that means that there are two aluminiums and three oxygens, so the chemical formula is Al2O3. Now, moving on to what we're going to do about using valency. Now, in this part of the lesson, what we're going to do is try to understand how to write chemical formula for chemicals that end in IDE and contain no clues whatsoever. And in terms of our success criteria for this part of the lesson, we want to be able to use the SVSDF method for writing chemical formula and be able to write the chemical formula for compounds made of two elements. So specifically, it's going to be compounds ending in ide where there is no clue word. So for example, sodium chloride, there's no mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, or hexa in there. So there's no clues. Magnesium oxide also doesn't have any of the clue words, and hydrogen fluoride doesn't have any of the clue words. For examples like this, you need a strategy that uses valency. And any compound that ends in IDE only contains two elements. For example, sodium chloride contains just sodium and chlorine. Iron oxide contains just iron and oxygen. And potassium sulfide contains only potassium and sulfur. There is one exception to this rule that we will look at later on, and that is hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide contains three elements. But usually if a compound ends in IDE, it means that there are only two elements in it. And there is a strategy for writing the formula of these compounds. And our plan is to use the SVSDF method. S stands for writing the chemical symbols, V stands for the valency, S for swap, D for divide, and F for formula and we'll show you a few examples of how we do this. So we're gonna start with sodium chloride. Now the first thing we do is we write the symbols. Sodium has the symbol Na, chlorine has the symbol Cl. We're gonna write the valencies. Sodium's in group one, it has a valency of one. Chlorine is in group seven, and it also has a valency of one. Remember, you're going to need to use valencies. What we do next is we swap the numbers. And so in this case, that doesn't change anything much, but it will become important in future examples. Then what we do is we look, can we divide the numbers to simplify this ratio? Now with a ratio of one to one, we can't. So it stays as one to one. Now what we do when it comes to writing the formula is we write the symbol and then we would normally write the number because that number at the bottom in the divide row tells you how many of each atom there is. So there's one sodium, one chlorine. When it comes to writing a formula, we don't need to write the number one in if there's only one. And so for this example, the formula is NaCl. Now here's another example, sodium oxide. Well, our symbols are Na and O. Sodium is in group one, it has a valency of one. Oxygen is in group six this time, so it has a valency of two. This time when we swap the numbers over, we can see that 
sodium now has a number two underneath it and oxygen has a number one. Now, can we divide to make these numbers smaller? We cannot, so we keep the numbers the same. So it's two and one. Now, when it comes to writing the formula, we write the symbol and then the number. So it's Na2 because there's two underneath sodium and oxygen with no number because there's one of them. And if there's only one, we don't need to write the number. Now we've got a final example here. It's magnesium sulfide. Ends in IDA, it means there's only two elements. The elements are magnesium, Mg, and sulfur, S. Magnesium is in group two, so it has a valency of two. Sulfur is in group six, so it also has a valency of two. When we swap the numbers, um, we can see it's still two and two. Now, when we ask the question, can we divide these to make them smaller? Our answer is yes. We can divide each number by two to give us a one-to-one -one ratio. And if we can go one-to-one, -one, that means the formula is going to be MGS. So the SVSDS method can be used for a whole host of chemical formulas, but only for compounds that end in IDA. And, oh, we've got one final example, sorry, silicon sulfide. Silicon, Si, sulfide is from sulfur and that's S. Silicon has a um, valency of four because it's in group four and sulfur is in group six, so it has a valency of two. When we swap those numbers, we end up with the silicon now having the number two and sulfur having the number four. Can we divide these to make them smaller? Yes, we can. Um, silicon, if we divide both through by two, silicon now drops down to one and sulfur drops down to two. So when it comes to writing the formula, it's SIS2. So here are a few for you to try. And um, there are six examples. I would recommend you pause the video and have a go at writing these. And remember, you will need um, access to the data booklet in order to do this. And um, so hopefully, this is now everyone who's paused the video returning to get the answers. So potassium fluoride should be KF, aluminium chloride, AlCl3, calcium bromide, CaBr2, calcium oxide, CaO, aluminium oxide, Al2O3, and magnesium nitride, Mg3N2. So that has been our initial look at writing chemical formula. So we looked at examples that have clues in the name and also an introduction to the SVSDF method. We will be expanding upon that in our next lesson.